Welcome back to another stock market open live stream. Today we begin we begin the countdown to not only the CPI report coming out tomorrow, PPI report coming out on the 12th, but also Fed Day. Yeah, we've got a really busy week of catalysts. Uh, and uh, usually uh, it's, uh, it's 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 quite entertaining when it comes to activity that we end up seeing in the stock market or the bond market. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised, as usual, right before big catalysts like this, to see some softness in markets going into uh, the week. Obviously, it's generally very difficult to suggest, oh, yeah, let's go spend all our money on stocks right before you get massive reports. So obviously since that would be an irony that isn't usually fulfilled in my opinion it would make sense to see some casualness going into uh both of these reports uh next report being uh it's tomorrow 5 30 a.m uh we'll be live we'll cover that that's in about 24 hours that cpi report looking for flat uh on a month over month headline basis which will include oil you know, is looking at uh, oil production, and oil pricing, and uh, rig count. We're actually down on rig count globally, about 157 year over year, uh, down about 628 rigs globally. But what I think is so interesting is that U.S. production appears to be up. Look at this. Found this so interesting. Quiet oil boom. Saudi Arabian oil production, we could see when oil cuts occur with these sort of dramatic cuts to the downside. Uh, then we could see Russian oil production somewhere blended in here, also with oil cuts uh, during COVID here, as everybody cut during COVID, and another cut over here. But uh, what we notice is this explosion of U.S. oil production finally above what we saw going into COVID. And uh, because of fears over peak oil, there's actually been this argument that, oh, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not actually going to see more U.S. oil prices because of, quote unquote, peak oil, making it less desirable to invest in oil rigs. Yet, even though that may be true, we're still seeing more U.S. oil production than we saw in 2019, which was supposed to be the year of peak oil. Really interesting. So that obviously is coinciding with this recent drop that we've had in oil prices. We look at uh, the international blend of oil at uh, $75. We'll know that uh, it's been a nice trend down, especially since September when uh, uh, when we've um, we saw a little bit of an oil price spike. Let's take a look at the chart together here just so you can see it. Go to the one year. Look at that, September. This was even before the Israel uh, crisis, right? Oil, uh, Israel, frank frankly, didn't do much for oil. We had our uh, attack in Israel that occurred uh, that we were also familiar with right here, uh, right about this weekend. It was on the 7th, on a Saturday. Here's your first day of oil opening up to uh, about 88 bucks. We ran up to about 92, 93. We're right back down to 75, which if you look at that, we're basically at the year's low. Crazy. Year's low. So we go ahead and zoom out to the five year. Look at that. Here's our 2022 oil price boom, where we had oil prices going to about $125 a barrel. Zoom out to about 2019. And what do we got? Some of the some of the numbers that we got here in 2019 put us right around where we are now. Eh, maybe a little lower. I uh, kind of have to go to some of these peaks over here in 2018 to really get to these mid 70s. But the point is, you're somewhat trending right back to where we were on these oil prices. It's a fantastic thing because oil prices really affect individual consumers and businesses' expectations for inflation. They're they're one of the most in your face measure of inflation, uh, or or at least they make you feel like there's inflation, right? So when oil prices are very high, you feel like, oh my gosh, your dollar's going less far. Everything's becoming so expensive. Uh, when when you flip this though, consider this. Take the previous oil uh, level over here right before COVID and let's inflation adjust it. Okay, lost it. Uh, let me fix that. So you go about 79 bucks on a high and uh, we'll go 2019, $79 on a high. 
Uh, actually, yeah. Okay, 2019, 79 bucks. So let's just take 79 bucks. Let's go. That's more like 2018. Okay, fine. Let's go $75, 2019 high. $75, 2019 high. Let's add about 18% for inflation. 1.18. Okay. That puts you inflation adjusted at $88.5 per barrel. Now, how wild is that? Where do we sit right now? We sit at $76. So inflation adjusted. Oil now sits at 14% less than what it was pre-COVID. Roughly. It's kind of cool. It's a great way, in my opinion, to look at not only the way we are we, we should be looking at stocks or oil or or, or uh, the costs of, of whatever it is we're doing, real estate, whatever. We should be inflation adjusting. I think a lot of us still have such a vivid memory of what prices were like in 2018. And I personally find it hard to argue that we're going to go back to those prices short of a massive crash. You know, so so you look at a six hundred fifty thousand dollar house. It's my favorite example to use. You add inflation to that of about eighteen percent. You're looking at a seven hundred sixty seven thousand dollar house solely because of inflation. So inflation added about one hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is wild because it it sort of evidences how real estate is an inflation hedge. The value of real estate goes up with inflation, but not only that, your debt becomes easier to pay off because somebody who had a loan of say $400,000 on that $627,000 or $650,000 house, let's say, uh, has, a, has a debt to value ratio of about 61%. Inflation happens and now all of a sudden it's a 767 house. Your debt to value just went down to 52%. So, so your debt just became substantially less expensive and your equity in the property just went up by nearly 10% solely because of inflation. Kind of cool. Uh, and then obviously, if rents go up as well, then it becomes easier to pay off your debt. Real estate is a fantastic tool for uh, inflation protection. Now, uh, again, speaking of inflation, tomorrow, CPI uh, expected to be flat month over month. Followed, following that, we're looking at CPI core to come in at... 0.3 percent uh 0.3 should be yeah there we go uh the uh the core read i'm hoping we get something a little softer than that i'm hoping we get something like a 0.2 let me pull up to see on a decimal level where we actually sit on that on the survey so yep average estimate 0.26 Low estimate, negative 0.1. High estimate, 0.4. So a lot of variation in what we think that CPI month over month core level is going to come in at. And it's going to be critical. Uh, that could, I mean, if we get a 0.4 on the month over month, yields will skyrocket uh, and, and the market will drop faster than you can even blink. I mean, nuts. Here are what the expectations look like on a graph. I'll remove myself for a moment. So you can see there's really just like one estimate over here for 0.4. There's one for 0.1. This estimator seems a little ludicrous though relative to the average, right? The average is pretty clearly here at about 2.6. There it is, 2.6. That's, that's the way to sort of look at this. As you can see, we have a beautiful little bell curve here as well. It shows you that midpoint. 2.6 being, or uh, yeah, 0.26 being the average. Okay, so then next we have the uh, year over year numbers are looking for 3.1 tomorrow on year over year and year over year core 4.0. Then, uh, then we got PPI literally the very next day, zero. PPI core 0.2, PPI core less trade 0.2, PPI final demand year over year 1.1, PPI core year over year 2.2, uh, and then we'll get our Fed meeting. 
And then after the Fed meeting, uh, which is on the 13th, which is Wednesday, on Thursday, we'll get retail sales and import prices and continuing claims. And then on Friday, we'll get S&P PMIs and Empire Manufacturing. So this is a crazy week for Catalyst. And usually what happens as well is after the Federal Reserve meetings, we get a little bit more of Fed speak as well. So it wouldn't surprise me to see uh, some more speeches by the Fed officials uh, in the days after the FOMC meeting. So again, the FOMC meeting this Wednesday. So if we look at speeches, testimony, I want to see if we have any forecast schedule yet. No, not convenient yet. Yeah, they're in their little blackout period right now where they go quiet for about seven to eight days before. Then they have their meeting, and then they all start going yapping again. I always think it's kind of entertaining. It's kind of nice when they're not yapping most of the time because the market's so much more volatile. Uh, Anyway, market's still pricing in a 125 basis point rate cut over time, obviously, next year. That is less than the 150 basis points that we were pricing in previously. And that also comes as we've seen the five-year break-even somewhat come off of its bottom a little bit. Part of that has to do with jobs. We got that warm jobs report. We got a little bit more enthusiasm for no recession call and therefore slightly higher five-year break-evens. Still very low, though, on the year here. As you can see that here. Very, very cool. All right. So let's see here. Then we have, uh, we've got, uh, that's the five-year break even. We got Macy's. Macy's should be up. Let me see here. I mean, they should be up like 15 to 20% based on that buyout they got, depending on how legitimate the market thinks it is. Macy's received a buyout for $4.8 billion, a buyout offer. They're uh, they're worth somewhere around 4.7. So we should see them up. Um, yep, look at that. There it is. 14.8% in pre-market on Macy's, up to about 20 bucks. Nice, uh, nice little recovery. Uh, we get a nice fat green candle uh, when the market actually opens today. Uh, of course, that's predicated on the deal actually being approved and going through. And it's a lot of work to do. Oh, this is, I find this very interesting. Oh, what is this? Uh, okay, so... Yeah, all right. Oh, that's nothing. All right, so what's next? Then, uh, oh, yes, uh, there was a report of an individual strategist who believed that the S&P 500 would rally in 2023, who just said, this is from uh, Oppenheimer Asset Management, their chief strategist forecast that in 2023, we'd have a big rally. They're believing the same will be true in 2024. In fact, their price target, somewhat interesting to see, their price target for what it's worth on the S&P 500 is... 5,200. That'd be about 8% more to go. Their quote is, we look for 2024 to be a year of transition. As markets navigate what we expect will be the Fed's pivot from restrictive monetary policy to an easier stance. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. It's almost like saying uh, volatile naked sush. <laughs> that's good. We'll see. I mean, these predictions, uh, they, they come and go like the wind, so you never know. Occidental uh, Petroleum's going around buying uh, buying some more drillers, just spending a quick little $12 billy on, on, uh, on some other uh, company. Don't mind. Don't mind another little $12 bill here. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence reporting that the Federal Reserve may actually be the leader of rate cuts uh, in the gro- uh, in sort of a, a global pace. Quote, with inflation tracking back to target and growth stumbling, central banks are set to pivot from rate hikes 
to cuts. We expect the Fed to deliver their first 25 basis point move in March and a total of 25 or 125 basis points for the year. In Europe, we expect 75 basis points of cuts and 50 from the ECB. And for the People's Bank of China, we expect them to continue with modest stimulus and 30 basis points of cuts. Uh, this is coming at the same time as Japan is struggling to keep it up. They're, uh, they're really trying to push inflation up. And they're struggling. They, uh, they're, they're not certain that they're going to be able to keep it up. And so uh, they're unconvinced that they're going to get away from negative rates anytime soon. Let's listen in to these folks for a moment. Oh, look, talking about oil, just like we did a little bit ago. If we do go into a recessionary environment, A, they can no. withstand that environment, and B, they can make the investments that will help them come out the other side much stronger. And I think if, you, you know, if you're looking at companies with too much leverage, then the risk is not only they can't make it through the recession, but they certainly won't be able to take advantage of the dislocations that happen in a period like that. Sure. And what about other, t other areas besides you know, those types of industrials? What, what now is uh, looking? Well, one of the companies we think looks really interesting right now is Texas Instruments. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting example because it's one where, you know, there's a there's been some slowdown in demand for analog chips, which is really their area of expertise. And that we think that's a really short term, that in the long run, secular trends are towards increasing use of analog chips. And TI is making a huge amount of investments in order to try to lower their cost of manufacturing and moving to um, moving to 300 versus the the 200 focus that they that they and their competitors are using right now, which will give them about a 20% cost advantage, assuming they can implement that successfully. So there's certainly some execution risk, but we think Ooh, that um, TI. TI, if you look at some, all I think about TI is that darn calculator you had to have for algebra class that everybody loved throwing away after they were done with school. Not really getting as much uh, of the focus right now. Heather, great to see you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. No. When we come oh, back. They're going on ad. All right. So take a look what else the suits are up to today. All righty. So some NASDAQ 100 changes. You've got uh, actually Zoom's in there uh, and Enphase and eBay, JD, Align, and Lucid. All of those being removed out of the QQQ. Yeah, got to get that performance up. Got to get those market caps up. So uh, I believe some of these will be back. Some won't be. Obviously, I believe Enphase will be back. Uh, but uh, some won't be, like Lucid, potentially. Uh, anyway, instead, you're going to get DoorDash, MongoDB, Splunk uh, joining, uh, along with uh, CDW Corp. Coca-Cola Europe Pacific Partners and Roper Technologies. That rebalancing is expected to take place on the 18th of December. Ooh, will it mark a bottom? Or are we already past the bottom? Who knows? All right, let's see how some of the uh, sticks are moving in the morning. So we've got, let's see here. Pre-market, Macy's on that acquisition offer up 15%. Look at that sympathy over here at Nordstrom. And then we've got uh, Palantir up about 1%. Looking at Fallers, you've got, there's Enphase down about 3%. Trade Desk about 3.5%. Coinbase about 3.8% as uh, BTC fell a little bit over the weekend. Let's see how BTC is doing right now. BTC. Here we go. 42. Some folks wondering, is this the sign that the ETF approval is actually close? That you're getting front running of selling as the ETF approval is close. Who knows? Uh, that's an interesting thesis. Uh, it's, it's possible. The uh, wider belief is that there's been a lot of speculating in uh, Bitcoin by institutions to really try to, you know, pump up the idea of the ETF and that there'll be a, some near-term pain in selling off crypto after a BTC ETF approval. Of course, we're still waiting for uh, that ETF approval. The most important window is 
probably going to be early January. So I'm not sure we're going to see anything here any yet, you know, before before the holidays. Uh, remember, you've got 13 companies trying to get an ETF approved. The last one was like a Swedish firm that just joined called Panda. Uh, and uh, there have been some adjustments as well in ETF applications over the last few weeks. Uh, leading some to believe that, uh, you know, companies like BlackRock know exactly what's going on and that they're in communication with uh, the SEC. And so they kind of know how to how to correctly file it. It's an interesting idea. It's probably not wrong. I get a phone call away from the SEC there. Hey, let's listen to what this guy here has got to say. Looks like he's reading. Architecture of their banking system is really important to understand. They've got roughly, I'm going to I'm going to use dollars, but uh, it's really an RMB. They've got about $57 trillion in banking assets. They've got about, uh, uh, you know, $2 trillion of banking equity. Uh, and then they've got their local government financing vehicle market, which financed all their real estate in local markets, is a $13 trillion market where 90% of the market's in default. So when you just think through all those numbers, Andrew, that dwarfs what U.S. banking system lost in the global financial crisis. We lost about $800 billion. Uh, we think that their real estate losses are $4 trillion at least, and we think that the local government financing vehicle market, we don't even know where the bottom to that market is. So. To, to, to have a properly functioning capital market, you have to understand the banking system and their banking system is in free fall right now. Okay, so uh, uh, let's stipulate, an, assuming you are correct, there, there's sort of two larger questions. One is obviously, what are, the, what are the issues for multinational companies doing business in China? What's gonna happen to their earnings and all of that? And we can talk about that. There's also yeah. the geopolitical question and maybe the political question about what this does to the power or lack of power uh, to President Xi Jinping. And I asked that question because I spoke just last week, or it was a week and a half ago now, uh, with the president of Taiwan, who actually said because of the economic challenges that she sees uh, China facing, she doesn't believe, for example, uh, that China would go forth uh, with an invasion, for example, of Taiwan. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I also know the president of Taiwan. And, you know, I think publicly, she has to say things like that. But I think if, if you're thinking this through this logically, um, if, if Xi Jinping is backed into a corner uh, and he's got youth unemployment somewhere between 20 and 40%. Yep. Uh, he's that's what we talk about. Their economy is too weak for a war. That's collapsed. He has wealth management products that aren't paying. Um, his regime is in real risk if he doesn't refocus uh, the national narrative. And, and my view on that is uh, a move on Taiwan would refocus the national narrative uh, more than uh, backpedaling in financial markets. So uh, while I understand uh, her desire to not be invaded, and, and we all hope that doesn't happen, uh, but if you were to look back over the last 50 years and choose a date and a time in which you thought America was its most vulnerable and had the worst, worst leadership it's had, uh, in the last 50 years, I, I think you would choose 2024 as maybe one of the, one of your uh, strike points. So I, I think all of those factors come together, whether it's financial, political, uh, um, or geopolitical altogether. Uh, I think all of the all of the arrows, unfortunately, point to something negative happening. It's interesting, in, in, even despite the economy, still thinks is, points to 24. Like? And I, I understand the argument that politically. If you're if you're having these challenges, it, there's a little bit of a let's don't focus on that ball, focus over here for a little bit. And I, I, I see that. But also, by the way, if you're having massive economic challenges internally, uh, it also creates a, a genuine complication with with pursuing some of these other uh, objectives for them politically. Right. Yeah, I mean, as you've seen that you've seen them, uh, Xi Jinping and, and his uh, comrades move around the world uh, trying to begging the Middle East to settle oil and RMB because as you know they're, they're if this were to happen and the US were to actually sanction someone you know our sanctions on Russia uh were were not even a 5% sanction we we didn't touch their energy business we left their banks on swift we let russians freely travel around the world i mean we really didn't do anything did we have, i was pretty sure we kicked them off swift that was like one of the first things we did uh, but i do think if we were to properly sanction china on this maneuver they need 12 million barrels of crude oil every day they need 8 bcf of LNG every day. They import 40% of their food every day and they have to buy it in dollars. So Andrew, they've got to figure out how to piece together uh, willing global trading partners that won't adhere. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. Like 
here, foreignpolicy.com. What does Russia's removal from SWIFT mean for the future of global commerce? Did I did I did I hear that wrong? Uh, didn't he just say we left them on SWIFT? I, I I don't know, man. Anyway, you know, here here's here's more on China. If we want some more on China, uh, another negative inflation print was released. I find it very difficult for the Chinese government to argue for war when your economy is already in shambles. Uh, you know, the, everybody's looking towards the Chinese government to stimulate more. You've got what's likely a recession going on in China. You've got this massive rejiggering of what the youth want to do in China. Uh, you know, some suggesting they don't want to work in factories, so they want to go work in farms and rural lives. I mean, the New York Times did a huge piece on this uh, just last week. You've got others saying they get a degree in electrical engineering and then they get a massively high paying job. Surprise, surprise. At, uh, at, at uh, electric vehicle manufacturers like Neo, you know, they're obviously in partnership with their contract manufacturer, but making Neos. But uh, let's see what we have here. The November inflation data was released over the weekend and headline CPI declined 0.5% year over year. Wow. Uh, deflationary prints in China. That's actually really interesting. Uh, even below the lowest level forecast by the Bloomberg survey, although much of the downside was related to food and energy, price weakness appeared widespread. Producer price index inflation showed falling inflation across various consumer goods and services, where inflation fell 1.2% year over year. So if this is the kind of deflation that we're getting, especially on durable consumer goods, which you could actually see is over here at that negative 2%, that is great for bringing inflation or, or deflation rather to America. This makes it easier to export deflation. There we go. To America. That's great. But this is not the this is not the kind of strong economy unless you think of a sort of a lash out economy. So a little bit uh, on the latest here on China. Uh, as far as uh, there was a comment here that I thought was interesting. Jimmy here says, did you watch the All In Pod? No. Uh, I spent very little time watching other YouTube. Maybe I should do that more. Uh, David predicted the Fed will cut 0.25% in Q1 2024. Okay, so he's matched the market expectations. And uh, Chamath said, if this happens, a trillion dollars of stock market or of money market money will come to the stock market. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. See, this is what we've been talking about for a while, is that as soon as you start cutting, what you're doing is you're signaling the end to high money market rates. You know, because people are like, oh, why would I invest in XYZ? Money markets are yielding 5%. Yeah, okay, well, for how long? Right? That's the thing that that is so quickly forgotten. Like, I hear this on real estate. You know, you could get a good deal in real estate in, in an area where, I'll just make an example. Let's say the usual cap rate uh, for, for a property in a developing neighborhood is, I don't know, 5%. And you get a good deal. And so yours is 7%. People are like, oh, why would I deal with real estate for 7%? Well, that beats my uh, treasuries. So maybe you would. But then you get people who say, okay, well, you get a good deal in a normal 2.5 or 3% market. Well, why would I do that? Even if you got a good deal at 4% for a cap rate, if you could get treasuries at 5 Well, because that probably won't last. Uh, unless, of course, you you buy like the 20-year bonds, which I actually have been saying regularly, I think is a great idea. But most folks who are looking at money markets because they want that liquidity will see, okay, once the Fed starts cutting, money markets are probably going to go in one direction, probably down. So you know, over time, as money market rates come down, your opportunity cost goes up. So that money has to go somewhere. Where does it go? Well, I think it flows into bonds, which ironically, as bonds get bought, their value goes up, yields uh, end up coming down, which potentially then also drives our money markets 
lower unless the Fed hawks for some reason. The Fed will will drive their own rates down quickly as well because expectations of Fed rates will also come down. And then that money has to go somewhere. So again, you could buy bonds or you could buy stocks or you could go back to the usual 60-40 portfolio where you buy both. That's what I think is highly likely to happen. Uh, but yes, funds in money markets have actually uh, absolutely exploded. And there is a lot of potential for money markets to move into stocks. And that's why I came up with the volatile Nike swoosh thesis is I strongly believe there's so much money on the sidelines just waiting for the signal to come over to capital markets. So we'll see. But uh, let's see if... Uh, uh, quickly pull something here quickly let's see can we get it yeah here we go yeah 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 exactly look at this see chamath might actually be low with his one trillion dollar estimate look at how much money you have in money markets 6.1 baby 6.1 trillies look at that explosion on the right side in money market accounts oops so you were previously at about an average of $3 trillion in money markets. You're double that. You've got $3 trillion available. So yeah, don't necessarily disagree. Somebody here says 50% crypto, 50% stocks. Some of my stocks are crypto related. Yeah, a lot of people agree with you. A lot of people who were uh, big fans and of, uh, of getting the crypto related stock, especially, I mean, look at Coinbase, for example, it's not fantastic. Couldn't the Fed just turn on the money printer to fight deflation? Oh, and they will. They absolutely will. I'm buying more Tesla with my excess cash. Nice. Shouldn't money markets go up if they cut? Why? Money is attracted to money markets when yields are higher. Money markets right now sitting at six point one four trillion dollars because the rates are at peak. I'm not. I'm not sure the thesis there as to why money markets would go up. So I'd be kind of curious to hear an explanation on that. Yeah, a lot of talk about this two hundred ninety million dollars of liquidation at BTC. You know, tracking the number, I think, is a little less important than the potential reasons. The reasons I always think are interesting. You know, some folks say, well, it's, you know, liquidation because of, you know, who knows, uh, regulatory liquidation requirements of Binance or other platforms. After all, uh, we saw, you know, we, we, we know Binance is now under massive regulatory scrutiny, finally. And uh, I don't know if they're going to be able to survive it. At the same time, we're keeping CZ stuck in America uh, as the uh, federal government decides what to do with them, basically. Very interesting. We did fall all the way as low as six, uh, 40,000, uh, but we are back to about 42 on BTC. See, nice little recovery there for a moment there. So if we go to, yeah, you can see that here. Yeah, so all of a sudden you get sort of those panic triggers going off. Uh, and remember, a lot, of, a lot of BTC trading, especially at times like this, is algorithmic. I mean, you're, this happened around midnight, East Coast time. So usually it, I mean, an algorithm can be very simple. You know, a, a, a drop like this of 1% in a candlestick could trigger substantial selling. It's, it's almost simple. It's it's not even, is it really algorithmic or is it more formulaic or are those one and the same? You know, if BTC drops 1% in one candle, sell, right? And, and then, then you're going to have the other formulas that say, if BTC drops 2% in one candle, buy. These are five minute candles. So not horribly unsurprising to see some of that volatility in both directions. So listen in over here. Not us. So just give we us a chance. That. Give us a chance. Give it all a chance. I kind of like it. 
initially, and I'm sure it'll grow on me. Let's do dollar yen. Can we get a dollar yen in the new look? Most important chart of the day. It's up today. The dollar is strong. The yen is weak after some Bank of Japan rumors that they might not get out of negative rates forever. Just, I, I think you know, that's a. It's the that's, first place I look in the that's morning. That's where we so should be we leading. This. Oh, they got some new graphics. A new look for C. Yeah, what is that? Weird. I like it. Yeah, bring the old stuff back. Got it. This is like an iPhone update. What is this? Because that's my. All right, Sarah's still here, so it's okay. Uh, so we can do it again, but I want to get a look at it. Oh, looks great. Is that a new picture of you? I guess so. Yes, <laughs> guess it is. That's a new picture. Very it's updated. Serious. Yes, old. How about that? Is that what you were thinking? No, I was thinking uh, handsome. Uh huh, handsome. Yeah. I don't yeah. know about that. Anyway. Serious. All right, journalist. thanks guys. I like that. Can't wait for that to happen in real time. Let's yeah, I don't. I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, yeah, what's in the corner here? Yeah. No, I, I want the I want like the the rattlesnake, you know, and and the old like blue and white line CNBC look. What what is this? This is so weird. Reach back in January third, twenty twenty two, Carl. And the question I think people are asking is, we've got a lot of macro events this week. Can we yeah. continue to climb through year end and into twenty twenty four? We've got central bank meetings galore. We have the Fed. We have the ECB. We have the Bank of England. We have Norway. We have Mexico. ECB just comes right after the Fed all the time to copy the Fed. Of course, we have some supply. We're still watching this Treasury supply in the next day, today and tomorrow. We're going to auction off some 10-year and 30-year bonds, which people are watching. The last 30-year was not that great. And then we've got CPI ahead of the Fed meeting on Tuesday, which has been a market mover and is key to some of the strength is that Inflation has come down even more maybe than expected at this point. That's what Goldman said over the weekend uh, has uh, come down even better than our optimistic expectations. They uh, lower their forecast for core PCE, move their expectation of the first cut from Q4 to Q3. Goldman's looking for about 50 basis points next year, not quite as much as consensus. Uh, but yeah, we'll also get New York Fed and see if we can back up the U University of Michigan expectations on Friday with some additional data. That's good news. Yeah, it was really good. Good news to see it come down. That was the decline on inflation expectations as well as a massive explosion on sentiment, which is which is good. So uh, let's take a look at this. This is uh, Goldman. Look at this. This is what they were just referring to. This is the uh, the piece. We're calling it the piece. I don't know. People are going to start thinking about talking about guns. <laughs> uh, anyway, where, where's your piece? What piece do you have? Uh, well, today we have a piece from Goldman, December FOMC preview. Sooner, but not soon. All right. Recent inflation data have been encouraging surprise. Even as our optimistic expectations and forecast path for the year on a uh, core PCE has fallen somewhat as a result, healthy growth and labor market data suggest that insurance cuts are not imminent Okay, so this is insurance cuts are just a fancy way of suggesting, uh, oh, no, we've driven the economy into a recession. Let's try to minimize some of the damage. Uh, that is not highly necessary right now. Uh, it, don't remember, though, and, and I think this is going to be Jerome Powell's job. Jerome Powell needs to kind of soften the blow of the rate cuts that are coming. So remember for a moment. It's so it's so simple, and, and he just needs to explain this. Jay Powell, if you're watching, explain the formula this week, man. Then we know you're watching, okay? Explain the formula, which you've done it before, but it's been like six months since you explained it, okay? So how do we do this? Well, it's simple. It's Fed nominal rate. So we throw Fed nominal rate at the top. Uh, and then what we need to do is add the um, targeted restrictiveness. Uh, there we go. And that gives us our total FOMC rate. Okay. There. So how does this work? Well, pretty simply. You should know this by now. If the Federal Reserve suggests we want, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, this should be, uh, I should have written this out as like an inflation rate. Uh, Fed nominal inflation rate. There we go. That's a little better, more clear way to put this. 
So if the Fed wants to be like if if a balanced market is zero in terms of uh, restrictiveness, zero is balanced. Then we know right now we're we're in restrictive, if not sufficiently restrictive. What about two point five? Inflation target for PCE three percent. Then this is how we get to a total FOMC rate of five percent, five point five percent, roughly where we are, right? Five point two five to five point five. And so, two things can really change here. You can get inflation slowly falling back to two percent, call it two and a half. And then you could start loosening the level of tightness. This is really what's going to change a lot first, is changing the level of tightness, the level of restrictiveness that you need. And as inflation comes down and proves it's trending down, you could slowly loosen up on the restrictiveness. So for example, you get down to 1.5. Well, now all of a sudden what you're doing is you're cutting down to 4%. There's your 125 basis points of cuts. So you've seen inflation come down and you've reduced the restrictiveness level. That is a good thing. Uh, And how the Fed could try to explain why they're cutting. Uh, But we'll see. Maybe that's... uh... Somebody says, I saw an ad for YouTube channel shares. Is this a scam? Can we invest in your YouTube channel? You know, I've, I've seen people do that. Uh... I'm not the biggest fan of it because you're you're betting on, you know, future earnings based on higher income, probably a lot of times COVID years. Um, I'm I don't know I, I think uh, I think it's a great people to rip people off, a great way to rip people off. I like it when people are able to make money, uh, you know, with with uh, what they're sold. I think then then that makes for longer term valuable customers, uh, and so. Selling selling shares in, in YouTube channels, well, that's like selling lottery tickets. I, I don't know. Not not the biggest fan of that. Uh, okay, so what else? Healthy growth in labor market data suggests that insurance cuts are not imminent. Uh, with core CPI likely to print near 27 bips on Tuesday, wage growth still too high. We don't think a normalization in cuts is necessary yet, basically. But... The better view on inflation news does suggest normalization cuts could come a bit earlier than a previous forecast of Q4 2024. Oh, they're they're throwing in the towel on late cuts. Interesting. We are therefore pulling our forecast for the first cut to Q3. The change does not reflect any major shift in our thinking, but rather the rough threshold for cutting that we have been given previously now being reached earlier. Basically, the formula of inflation coming down is is starting to play out sooner than expected, which is great. That's what we want to see. So they're revising to Q3 for cuts. A lot of people sitting at Q2. They only expect two cuts next year and then more cuts in 2025. I really don't know how much it matters as long as the trend begins, the trend of cuts. Because again, once the trend begins, remember what you're going to do. As soon as you cut, the moment you cut, what do you do? You signal uh, signal a confirmed one bottom in bonds and two top in money markets, right? And think about it. As soon as you cut, you signal, that's it. Bond prices are up from here and bond, and money market yields are down from here, which both of these reiterate the 60-40 allocation. You know, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, or quite frankly, even... You know, it's not personalized financial advice for you, obviously. But uh, what a lot of people do is they take their age. You start at like 20 with a 60-40. And then uh, then you kind of adjust. You go over 60-40 portfolio depending on your age. So you might add like a percent to bonds over time. So, you, you know, at 20, you might be 
80% stocks and 20% bonds. At 40, you might be 60-40. At 60, you might be 40-60. At 80, you might be, you know, 20% stocks, 80% bonds. It's just a rough formula people give. Reminds me kind of of like your heart rate. I don't know why, but I think they say your max heart rate. It's like, what do you start at like 200 and then you subtract your age? Maybe it's 220 and you subtract your age. Hmm. Kind of want to look now. I don't know why that matters, but max heart rate subtract age. I don't know. Just try. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Subtract your age from 220. A 50-year-old person would be expected to have a maximum heart rate of 170 bips, uh, bips, beats per minute. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway. All right. Next. What do you got, Sarah? Stores and the sales that it's that it's had. I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenge industry for sure. Well, uh, department stores are tough because, um, as City says this morning, uh, it's where companies sell other people's stuff. Uh, uh, and in a world of e-commerce, that gets uh, it's difficult to do that that yeah. model. Uh, City does point out. I'm honestly surprised they still exist. Like Macy's and Sears, well, I mean Sears went bankrupt, obviously, but like Macy's and the 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 Kohl's and and these bigger stores. I don't know. Every time I go peek at them, I'm like, feels dead compared to what it used to be. Reporting here, uh, the CNBC.com. Although they've they've done a lot of shifting to online. In fairness, listen, uh, you know, interest from parties uh, in terms of the real estate value. Borat, Borat says. 125 bips of cuts. You are delusional. I don't know why that sounds German, but anyway, uh, like weird German. But um, it's really interesting because I didn't say uh, 125 basis points of cuts, saying that's what the market's pricing in. So you're calling the market delusional. It's fine with me. <laughs> you know, do whatever you want. But uh, but yeah, there, there are a lot of people who, uh, who believe uh, that... Uh, any kind of a start off to rate cuts is just going to set off massive inflation again. Yeah, because that's what happened the last time the Fed cut. Not. I mean, think about it. The last time Fed cut COVID pandemic, the cuts weren't what created inflation. It's massive money printing and helicopter money. But ignore that since those both occurred at the same time. Go back. When was the last time we had cuts before that? Well, we had a big pause at the end of 2018 and, uh, you know, sort of a, a peaking out uh, and then trending down in 2019. We didn't have any inflation. In fact, we were trending below trend. We were talking about reducing the inflation target. It's crazy. Can you do 60, 40 stocks, crypto? I mean, yeah, you can do whatever you want. Uh, you're doubling up on risk assets. But then again... You know, bonds this cycle ended up being a risk asset, right? The 60-40 portfolio had the worst, I think, the worst year ever in history in 2022. Worst year ever. It's crazy. It's supposed to be diversified, right? 60-40 stocks, bonds. One goes down, the other one goes up. Nope. That was not the case. Anyway, let's see how the bond market's doing. So I got a bonds. We've got, wow, 10 years actually up 2.5 basis points. Uh, indices red by a couple basis points. You've got oil red by 13 basis points. Gold almost back to 2000, 2008. <laughs> no, not the recessionary year, but back to 2008 in terms of nominal price. So going back, let's see what else Goldman has to say here. Uh, higher, higher for longer, they argue. Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's the most generic thing I feel like you could say right now. I know that. Sooner, but what not too soon. What do we got here? Year over year, core PC inflation forecast has de declined as a result of better news. Good. It's not to say that the overall inflation picture is close. To where Fed officials feel comfortable. We think October inflation data overstated a bit of good news. Well, we'll see what comes out tomorrow. 
not every box needed for normalization cuts is checked yet. Wage growth is headed in the right direction, but we'll have to follow a bit further. Here's the Goldman Sachs wage tracker. It is the uh, dark blue line right here. Does show you that you're still elevated relative to where that 3% target is for the Fed. Although, wait, didn't we? Yeah, we just got a 0.4 on the month over month, right? Let me look at that again. That was Jobs Friday. Jobs Friday. Yeah, average hourly earnings 0.4. It's true. So definitely still a little bit of work to do over here. They want to see that closer at like 0.2 to 2.5. So a little rich there on job gains. Although, again, you wonder, like, at what point is that due to striking workers coming back to work uh, and single month changes? So we'll really have to look for a trend there. Oh, take a look at this. Here's the Goldman Sachs GDP forecast as of the September FOMC looking at 2.1%. And uh, prices, 3.79. As of November, 2.7 on GDP. They actually think GDP has gone up. Oh, bullish. Yeah, oh, all right. Interesting. The, um, on corporate, so here's how we think about corporate. Um, air quotes around everybody talks about corporate not coming back. But pragmatically, um, the U.S. economy has grown quite a lot. This is about, yeah, this is about air travel. And so what managed travel will come back has come back. What really hasn't come back that I think people um, are forgetting is that one-day trip. And eventually when people can trust the industry again, it will come back. Mm. It sounds like that's where you think loyalty may fold in, yeah? Exactly. Um, Delta has already a very good group of loyal customers. And as the American Express card becomes accepted in more locations, we think they'll be able to pick up additional credit card holders. And it's proven by really all the airlines that if you have a credit card, you're more loyal. So what's yeah. with the stocks, Helene? I mean, they're, they're barely <laughs> up year to date. They haven't been that great. I guess there are worries about demand continuing and whether we've seen the, the bulk of it, especially if we're heading into a slower period or even a recession. They've got high debt loads coming out of COVID and high interest rates. And these are just some of the bare, bare reasons against your call, right? Yeah, those are really good bare reasons too. Thanks, Sarah, for pointing them out. Um, so, so here's how we think about that. To your point, um, as, as it relates to Delta specifically, our view is that um, Delta is actually in a pretty good place with respect to its balance sheet. Its goal is to get net debt down to $15.15 billion, which would make it among the best um, of the, the... The amount of debt these airlines have is ridiculous. It's one of the things that drives me so nuts in terms of trying to invest in an airline because I just think it's... it's the competition's too perfect. You know, it's just... And they're talking about, they've been talking about cutting airfares for like a year now. You could have seen it coming from a mile away if you paid attention to the earnings calls, which of course we do in the course member live streams. Uh, Gold course right now is like really popular. So if you're not part of that yet, it gives you live stream access and brand new lectures with more of them coming out at the end of the year. So check those out, meetkevin.com. You can bundle up if you've already got existing. But uh, consider this here, JPM last week, We've got some uh, new data. This data confirmed by bank at C-Suite Industries shows, still shows elevated levels of cashola. Yes. Uh, the data suggests that uh, from peak until Q3 2023, the, the cash dis dissipation rate, about 25 billion a month, most of the increase is coming in checking accounts, which have increased from 1.5 trillion to 4.5 trillion. Pre-COVID, we hit about 1.7 trillion. Savings moved up from 10.9 to 11.3. Money market funds 
Well, that's interesting because the money market funds measure we looked at was like from three to eight. So yeah, this is a total financial assets right here in money market funds. So I think that's somewhat interesting. Uh, this discussion about cash levels at JPM. Let's try to understand that a little better. Cash levels. Here we go. Yeah. So this might be JP Morgan money market funds, but anyway, obviously 30 percent ish more. Eight minutes to the bell, by the way. We're set. Okay. What's the difference between the cash measurement and the Fed's excess savings? The Fed's measure doesn't include capital gains, dividends, inheritance, or home equity loans. Recessions typically see U.S. household net worth decrease, whereas COVID recession increased U.S. households net worth. It's a good example or, or a, a, a good observation, rather. The U.S. added $40 trillion in net worth since the beginning of COVID. Wow. Think about that. Any net worth increase you've gotten over the, uh, since COVID is part of this. Part of this $40 trillion net worth increase we've seen. Elevated cash levels do not necessarily mean a boost for consumption. Elevated cash levels uh, just simply mean the consumer is far better capitalized than the excess savings measure suggests. Could be why you're just continuing to see real estate purchasing uh, from consumers. Still speculators, though. Still getting a lot of the hard money flippers coming out, uh, speculating on uh, springtime pops. I'm not so convinced about a springtime pop. I mean, I think in 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 time, buying real estate, good deals now will, will be a good hedge deal. No guarantees, obviously. But uh, you know, thinking about a pop in the next three to four months, I don't know. Good luck, flippers. Consider that this is the first time the Fed the uh, or or is the first tightening cycle where corporate profits have increased and net interest expense has declined. Wow. First tightening cycle where corporate profits have gone up and net interest expense has declined. That's wild. Combine this phenomenon with a still historically strong consumer and we have a bit more runway before seeing margin compression and spikes to unemployment. Yeah. I agree about more runway. Further, a higher for longer environment, if it materializes, may have a more muted impact than expected given the health of consumer. Yeah, that's kind of what we have been seeing. Very interesting. I like that piece. That's a good one by JPM. I don't know. I don't know how, how we feel. How do we feel about uh, the new CNBC de design? Straight Chillaxon says, increase in net worth is debatable. Increased net worth at the cost of 40-year high inflation. Well, yeah, like you say here, increased net worth of asset holders. What, what have I been saying on this YouTube channel since like 2017? Get out of cash, get into assets. Always, always say that. Nothing's changed. Been zero flip-flop. I've been very, very consistent in that. Uh, somebody else here says financial conditions are not tightened, just game on. What does that mean? I can look at financial conditions. Five year break. Would house hack buy a house with acreage? Why? That's farm hack, bro. That's not house hack. That's farm hack. It's a different business. No. <laughs> uh, Goldman Sachs. Financial conditions index. You know, we do real estate analysis in the course member live streams. And, it's, and, and we have this huge archive of course member live streams as well. It's really a useful tool for people to see how, you know, how to value real estate and how not to get screwed. Valuing real estate is very different from valuing stocks. All right, let me get into this chart. Here are the Goldman Sachs financial conditions. Uh, wait, no, that, hold on. That looks like the five-year break even. Wrong chart. Yo, bro, where is it? 
Come on. Come on, Dropbox. You can do it. Anyway, financial conditions index down again. Question now is, there it is. Uh, how low will we go? Boom. There it is. Goldman Sachs financial conditions index. We are now so low and 99 over here. Draw that line across. We're basic, we're we're trending towards the lows of the year. I'm not at lows of the year yet, like we are with the uh, break evens. Yeah, we already covered the NASDAQ. Where you been? Watch the video back on 2X. Don't want to be redundant. Farm hack. We buy farms and plant money trees. Who's investing? <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, we're going to start having more house hack updates on the house hack YouTube channel this week. Does house hack use leverage? Not yet. Uh, so, uh, stay tuned for updates this week. I would say filming again today. We didn't think we would be, but probably means tomorrow at the earliest, but, uh, yeah, just see the house hack YouTube channel and, and, and you'll see them all. All right. What we got here? It's important to us. That was Occidental CEO Vicky Holla earlier on Squawk Box talking, of course, about their decision to buy Permian producer Crown Rock. Now, the overall price tag is $12 billion, but a $9.1 billion of that is new debt. They're going to also issue $1.7 billion of uh, common equity. And, um, and look at that Tesla sell off before the bell right here. Just what we need. More of a sell off. Not look at that. Everything's selling off before the bell. Google. NASDAQ, not as much. Why are Google and Tesla selling off before the bell? Look at Apple. What's going on here? You get some uh, some big old algorithmic selling or something going on here before the bell. Not an end phase, though. Hmm. That's bizarre. All right, one minute here. Chevron buying has so a lot of industry consolidation and pressure to get bigger. You know, just reading one research note here, MKM Roth saying that it looks a little pricey, the deal. Um, just on an initial take here, they're they're measuring it. Yeah, here's Intel. You're right, holding up. Dollars per underdeveloped acre and 4.4 million per primary location. So just as a as an industry metric, there they also say that they they thought the that are up a couple percent. Negative. All right, 40 seconds to the bell. Position, according to analysts of the Anadarko deal, remember from Oxy, yes. back in 2019. Yeah, well, they that's the stock came under a great deal of pressure. After and that. remember, we'll be live on the Meet Kevin podcast uh, uh, show later today. Uh, there's a link, there uh, should be a link in the description for uh, that podcast channel. And then, of course, get the House Hack channel as well. Uh, I believe that may be the case. It's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a hard deal to get done. That said, you did get two second requests, but of course, much larger deals for both Chevron and Exxon. Uh, it's been active today uh, and over the weekend. The deal is either getting ready or unwritten. Let's get the opening bell here. And see this here. That's a good boy. Guardian of Green Foundation and MSC. I don't know. I don't. I don't like the new CNBC thing. Maybe it's just different. But it, 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 the old one was good. I don't know. I, let's see if they throw it up again. It was like 50-50 green red. Them is they, they often pick stocks that are underperformed or that the consensus isn't friendly on. They're not obvious. No. So maybe we could pick out a few of them and see if they're having an impact on the market. Nike got a All little right. bit of love. Boring. Uh, so uh, here's the movement. You got Tesla down about 44. Uh, the Q's down five right now, which is actually green candle sticking. And Apple also red along with uh, Tesla, Google, these guys sell them down. Let's see how Macy's is moving in that post market bell. Uh, Best Buy, Nordstrom, Nordstrom five and a half. Best Buy two point eight. Macy's fourteen. Intel's up one three. Costco's right there along with American Eagle. On the downside, Coinbase, Open Door, Robinhood. Where did Enphase go? Wasn't Enphase over here? When did they get deleted? <laughs> Let's find them. Where'd they go? Oh, wow. Wow. Enphase just deleted. 
a 3% decline in the pre-market to actually go positive. Well, it's bobbing. So we'll see what happens here. That's bizarre. Apple's still declining. BTC just popped down a slight little bit, uh, falling under that 42 level there. Oh, Macy's now dropping. There goes Macy's. Ooh, Macy's. Lost the lead. Oh, and, uh, huh, entertaining. Yeah, let's listen in here for a moment. Uh, the layoffs, uh, some 17% of Spotify's uh, workforce, despite the fact that the shares have done extraordinarily well this year. Yeah, they say that could be either red as scary or promising, <laughs> that analyst uh. note, right? And what, what, what Spotify sees, it could foretell a surprising slowdown, for instance, in sales growth, but they take the other side and say that... If sales and jobs are strong, then this is going to be very good for earnings and for margins. And so they, they upgraded it to 300. That's still a big climb, about 50% from where we are right now, even though, as you say, Spotify has already had a one. That's weird. I wonder why they keep reading though. Um, did want to uh, hit El Pri Harris, uh, if I can. You know, sometimes... It's, it's, I bet you there's like a child up there. That that keeps pushing the button, which is actually kind of funny. In this case, that uh, that appears to have been the case. D.E. Shaw press release this morning out from L3 Harris. They named two new directors to their board. Kirk Hachigian, he's the former chair and CEO. Uh, uh, yeah, boring. All right. How about here? And then we'll see what the suits are saying. All right. So how did it start moving or keep moving here? Oh, Macy's ticking back up again. And really want to watch those cues. Oh, Q's went positive. How interesting. Look at that recovery. Very interesting. Okay, let's go to what the suits are saying. Bitcoin's volatility is a feature, not a bug. Cryptocurrencies are hot again with Bitcoin fee, uh, soaring above 40,000, only to plunge as much as 7.5% on Monday. Not a clear explanation for the decline other than this is what we've come to expect from Bitcoin. Well, okay. We touched earlier on the liquidations and some of the ETF speculation. Another dismal set of inflation data for China uh, does make it, uh, uh, according to some, feel like sentiment for Chinese stocks can't get worse. I wonder how the MSCI China is doing. Wow, look at that candle in NASDAQ. Dang. MSCI China. Uh, this is this is an example of clean technologies that would be like solar. Let's go to uh, how about consumer staples? We could try that. Here's consumer staples, China, MSCI, New China. That doesn't even show up. I need to get some more ticker, tickers here. How about China's real estate ETF? I mean, look, it's all everything's down, which makes sense. Come on. MSCI China. How about global China ETF? There you go. Let's zoom out a little bit more. One month chart. Oh, you're going to have to do a little better than that. Let's go down to day chart. Fortunately, and uh, unfortunately for China, a lot of a lot of the Chinese stock market just poops, de doops. What about Baba? They have ADRs over here. Yeah, same thing. It's Neo, same thing. How about BYD? BYD Global. Uh, BYD, 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 BYD. Better. All right, back to here for a moment. And I will actually want to get a little more commentary from the suits here. Uh, food prices have driven down China CPI. Big move in yen rates is peanuts. That's fine. Downbeat Malay says things bondholders want to hear. Inauguration speech was somber. There's no money, he said, promising economic shop therapy. Failed to mention dollarization, which may be confirmation that he will be more pragmatic than he was on the campaign trail. We'll see. Insur almost insurmountable economic problems. High poverty, heist in 20 years, inflation of 150%. Mm. 
almost got you almost have to leave the currency. It's gonna collapse. Anyway, listen in more here. I, I wish they'd gone with my idea, seven stocks. You know, seven stocks. Seven stocks. Yeah. That's what you want. That's what you want. I want an hour though. devoted to seven stocks. Yeah, and I want to call then it seven stocks. Then how could we talk about dollar yen? Well, because it's related to the seven stocks to Nvidia somehow. Speaking of the seven stocks, one of the stocks. seven stocks. Can we talk about the seven they're stocks? Not, they're not up today. No, they're down today. Yields are they're, up. Actually, so they're down they're rather. Buy. They're down rather sharply today. Apple um, gets a lot of analyst love, but it is not helping right now. It's just fallen below a three trillion dollar market value. Uh, has Apple, uh, but again, look at the move. Well, that's the magnificent seven overall. Now not up quite a hundred percent for the year, and then Apple as well. But you can see all. Uh, all down. They rallied, though, uh, last week. Yeah, and today, uh, TD Cowan names NVIDIA one of their best ideas for 24, uh, target of wow. 700. Uh, they named Snow another best idea. Interestingly, we are going to get some switch outs in the NASDAQ 100. Uh, look at names like yep. eBay today. Uh, it's leaving. Lucid, uh, Zoom are all getting cut. And then names like Dash and, uh, and Enphase getting at it with some positive gains this morning. Yeah, we'll watch that rebalancing. Look, the NASDAQ 100 is up. And that uh, rebalancing is on the 18th, by the way. Uh, rate cuts can't come fast enough for debt strapped companies. This is a great point. It's really, rate cuts are going to help those smaller cap companies substantially. But the question is, are they going to survive by the time the rate cuts come? That's the big question. Uh... Because you've got the larger companies like Microsofts of uh, the Microsofts of the world who are actually benefiting off these rate, uh, these these high rates. Their net interest net interest going positive, as we covered earlier. Their net interest is going positive, and their earnings are going up at these larger companies, or smaller companies are seeing earnings decline and interest expenses go up. Very difficult time. Going to help energy companies. It's going to help right. financials. I think if Jim were here, he would note the move in financials, which is higher this morning and has been really flexing some strength um, lately. Financials as a group, which he says obviously is good, good for them and good for overall. There's a uh, Tesla trying to make a little bit of a bottom there at uh, down about 60 bips. Nasdaq still rallying. Look at those financials Sarah's talking about. Go to JP Morgan. Zoom out on the week chart. Yeah, look at that recovery on financials. Almost a bottoming out at the end of 2022 for JPM. Let's go to City. Uh, City. City Group. Here we go. Here's City Group. Somewhat flat. Let's go to American Express. Uh, Mid range on the Fibbies. Visa. Nice. Straight up on Visa here. Very, very nice. Wow, you wouldn't even know that a pan pandemic hit Visa. A little sideways trending here, but boy, that one just stays strong, huh? Uh, MasterCard. And the same thing. Looks just like Visa. Incredible. Incredible. All right, so we'll see how this expands. Uh, let's go ahead and push the button here, and then uh, we'll listen into CNBC for another minute or so. But let's get this out of the way. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is neither personalized financial advice nor real estate yes. advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed wow. by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purpose of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services which we may benefit from. I personally operate and actively manage ETF and hold long positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuers other than Health Act, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. Yeah, this is interesting. This uh, uh, NVIDIA bottoming out uh, down about 469 for the morning here. And uh, Google down about 2%. Some people think Google's down because they think uh, they, they faked their Gemini demonstration. Oh, Apple trying to get or, uh, Tesla trying to fall back right back down again. Uh, Enphase though, really trying to push up here. Uh, I mean, they are they're blowing this. Uh, it's kind of like a middle finger to the Nasdaq. They're like, we don't need you. Q Q Q. You're gonna pick DoorDash over us. See you later. Yeah, crazy. 
All right, I'm gonna go post the course member live stream and uh, we'll pay attention to this as well as news from the suits here from the rest of the day. And uh, they're talking Paramount. Okay, well, that's boring. All right, we will see you either later today or tomorrow or whenever I put, well, probably for the podcast. So we'll see you for the podcast if you're not joining the course member live stream. So until then, thanks so much. And uh, I don't know, let's push this button. Just close the fucking door. Close the door.